This phenomenon of party alignment is mostly evident in one particular party, which would be the Democratic Party. So this hurts the Democrats more. Guys, you gotta be quiet. Let people concentrate, please. Party the alignment is the gradual um, phenomenon in which people have been losing their party identification, becoming more independent, and this phenomenon hurts the Democrats the most. If you see statistics over the years, this is real. This is evident in the Democratic Party. However, there's one coalition that have remained loyal to the Democrats, and that would be the African Americans. While all the other groups that used to support the Democrats, their support has been waning and decreasing the Democratic Party. African Americans have remained a loyal coalition that have voted and re-elected Democrats over the years. But most of these coalitions are fleeing the parties, especially the Democratic Party. All right, this is a big topic on your particular AP exam. Who, which coalitions belong to which party today? Make sure that you draw this T-chart. Today, Democrats and the Republicans are supported by different coalitions. Give me a coalition that supports Democrats today. African Americans are one. Give me another one. Women, LGBT community will be here. The young people would be here. Poor minorities would be here. Most minorities would support the Democratic Party. Liberals would be on this side. All right. On the Republican side, we have white people. Religious, Religious people would be on this side also. Rich. Christian evangelicals would be on this side. Rich, Rich people would be here also. Um, when it comes to religious people, you can put Christian evangelicals. That's going to be a wording on your test. But not only that, also Catholics. Most Hispanics in the United States vote Democrat. However, in pockets of Hispanic populations that are overly or uber Catholic, a lot of them vote Republican. So Catholics would be on this side also. Because of the Republican stances on gay marriage and abortion, Religious people are usually on the Republican side of the equation. Old people usually are more conservative and more to the Republican side. <clears throat> Put a star on this particular graph. It's going to be like three questions on your multiple choice. <clears throat> if this guy says this, this, which party would we probably identify with? That's the kind of question that you're going to get on your multiple choice. All right, we're going to move on. Chapter 8, Lesson 3, go ahead and draw a line or skip a page. Chapter 8, Lesson 3. Like usual, this is the most important lesson in this particular chapter, the third one. Chapter 8, Lesson 3. We're talking about third parties or minor parties in the United States. So for a while, for the last two lessons, we've been focusing on the Republicans and the Democrats, but there are other parties in the United States, like the Green Party, the Libertarian Party, the Socialist Party, the Communist Party of the United States. But they're not as important as the major parties, but they do play a role in our political system. Alright, let's look at the board. That graph right there represents the United, the United Kingdom's parliament. Parliament is like their Congress. It's like their Senate and the House of Representatives. This is their lawmaking body. This is their legislative branch. This is where they make laws. Each one of these colors represent a political party. What do you notice? There's a lot of big ones, but there are also tiny ones that are represented. Like, for example, this gray party right here, 7.72% of the entire Congress, the entire Parliament, is from this party. Let's look at the United States House of Representatives compared to the Parliament of the UK. What's the difference? 
There's only two parties in there. There's only Republicans and Democrats that are members of the House of Representatives. All 435 members of the House of Representatives either belong to the Republican Party or they belong to the Democratic Party, who's not there. Third parties aren't there. People from the Green Party aren't there. People from the Communist Socialist Party aren't there. Only two parties are represented in the House of Representatives because in other countries, they don't have what we have. In other countries, they have what we call a multi-party system where two or more than two parties have a chance of winning elections. In the United States, if you are not Republican or Democrat, you're going to have a very tough, ch um, very tough chance of actually making it into office, or actually getting elected into office, if you're not from either one of those two parties. But in the other countries, this is this is normal. In most countries in the world, different parties are represented in their government. Even minor parties have a voice. Even minor parties are represented in their government. While in the United States, this is not what we have. What we have in the United States is a two-party system. Usually only two parties dominate elections and control government. Ever since the Federalists and the Democrat Republicans were founded, the United States has been mostly a nation of two parties. Third parties were not allowed in. Third parties were not allowed a foothold in our government. A lot of people, they don't have a lot of support like these two parties do. Which is a negative sometimes because the voices of the few, the voices, the tiny voices of the minorities are not heard in our particular government. Only the Republicans and Democrats are there. All right, so let's talk about third parties. Third parties are alternatives to the two major parties. Alternatives to the two major parties. They offer us an alternative choice from the Republicans and the Democrats. There are three types of third parties in the United States. So types of third parties, we'll talk about that right now. Splinter parties, ideological parties, and single issue parties. These are the three types of third parties in the United States, or minor parties in the US. You need to know the difference between each one. Some third parties are what we call splinter parties, from the word split. Splinter parties came, broke off from a major party, and they formed their own party. So for example, back in the late 1800s, the Republican Party had a crisis. Um, one, of, one of their most popular members, Theodore Roosevelt, didn't win the nomination for the Republican Party, so he was like, screw the Republicans, I'm going to make my own party and run under their nomination. So out of the Republican Party, Theodore Roosevelt took his supporters and they formed the Bull Moose Party. And they broke off from the Republicans. And this usually happens a lot. People breaking off the Democratic Party, people breaking off the Republican Party, and forming their own tiny third parties. So splinter parties, parties that broke off, from a major party, an example of which would be Theodore Roosevelt's Bull Moose Party. But perhaps the most common type of third parties is the second one, ideological parties. Parties that are all about a certain type of ideology, a certain set of beliefs. Like, for example, libertarians subscribe to libertarianism, an ideology that's to the right of conservatism. Think of libertarians as extreme conservatives. If conservatives want a small government, libertarians want a really, really small government. Socialists are to the left of Democrats. Socialists and communists are to the left of Democrats. They want a lot of control, government control over the economy. So these are ideological parties, they're parties that subscribe or that support a certain ideology. ideology. 
whether that be communism, socialism, libertarianism. <laughs> the next party, type of party, single issue parties in the United States. Single issue parties are just like what they're called. They're only concerned about one particular issue or one particular policy. They don't care about anything else. They have one thing that they care about. Now, the Green Party is a bad example because the Green Party used to be a single issue party. What did they used to only care about? It's called the Green Party, so what do they care about? The environment. The environment. They had environmental concerns. That's the one issue that they care about. But today, the Green Party has evolved and they have more stuff on their platform, but they used to be just a single issue party. These other two, I'm sure some of you talked about in U.S. history, got a Know Nothing Party and the Prohibition Party. Anybody remember what the Prohibition Party wanted? Prohibition. Prohibition, the end of what? Alcohol. That's the end of selling, buying, and the production of alcohol in the United States. That's the only thing that they cared about. They don't care about gay rights or the economy and stuff like that. Anybody know what the Know Nothing Party was about? I don't know anything. Sorry? I don't know anything about Not quiet. The Know Nothing Party was all about hating on Catholics and hating on immigrants, specifically Irish immigrants, who were both immigrants and Catholics. We're called Know Nothings. All right, let's talk about the importance of third parties in the United States. Third parties in the United States, this is what you should know. This is going to be a question on your test. Third parties in the United States don't often win elections. They lose almost all the time. There would be rare instances that we get an independent or a, li uh, or a, or a libertarian or a Green Party member into Congress, but that is not the norm, that is the exception. Most of the time, they get, they, uh, they get defeated during elections. They lose most of the time. But it does not mean that they're not important. They do have a special role that they play. They can affect American politics in major, major ways. Probably the most profound way they can Ameri uh, affect American politics is number one, they can split the vote. Sometimes they can take away votes from a major party and they can spoil a victory from a, par from a party or they can be kingmakers. So what do I mean by that? 18 years ago, we had a presidential election in this country. One of the closest presidential elections in U.S. history, if not the closest election in U.S. history, the Democrats were running with a guy named Al Gore. That's the guy that they nominated. The Republicans were running with who? 2000. Bush. So we have Al Gore and George W. Bush, election of 2000. It came down to about thousands of votes. It was very, very close. It came down to one state. That would be Florida. During this time, there was another party running. The Green Party was running. And they had a guy named Ross Perot running for president, he knows he's not going to win. The Green Party is like the Democratic Party, but they're more liberal than the Democrats. And they actually, they're very, very much into the environment as well. The problem with this for the Democrats is during the election, if you're a conservative, you got one choice. Who do you vote for? You vote for Bush. Republicans had all of the conservative votes. But if you're a liberal, you got yourself a choice. Most of them are going to vote for the Democrat because they don't want to waste their vote. But some people who don't like the Democrats or who don't think the Democrats are liberal enough, what would they do? Green. They would vote for the Green Party. The Green Party will steal some votes away from the Democrats, even though they're not going to win anyway, just by them showing up, just by that name showing up in the ballot box, some of those votes are going to get taken away. And eventually, we, um, George Bush won this election, but according to statistics, if Ross Perot never would have run, there would have been no question Al Gore would have won that election. But because the Green Party existed, they took votes away from the, uh, from the Democrats, making George W. Bush win. They played kingmaker and made Bush win. They made spoiler and made Gore lo uh, lose that election. So they can split the votes. They can take away votes from a major party and ultimately decide elections. And they've done this a lot. It's not their fault. I mean, they, everybody has the right to participate. But this happens a lot. Second important thing about third parties, they bring new issues 
to the policy agenda that the two parties are not talking about. New policy issues that the two parties are not really concerned about are brought to the policy agenda because of third parties. So I'll give you an example. One of those is child labor laws. Back in the late 1800s, um, factories were employing children in their factories. Um, when something in a machine breaks in a factory, it's good to hire children because they're cheap and they can put their arms into those little nooks and crannies. Accidents happen, but that's what, that's what it was back then. The child labor was a thing. There was no child labor laws in the United States. There was no minimum wage also. The Republicans and the Democrats were not talking about having a minimum wage and ending child labor in the United States. There was one tiny party that was talking about it, and that was the Socialist Party. They called for better factory conditions, better wages, and no more child labor. And when the public picked up on it, the Republicans and the Democrats adopted that on their platform, but it was the Socialist Party that actually brought it into the public limelight. And that's what third parties can do. That's why you see a lot of these single issue parties, they pop up and then they get absorbed by a major party, There's, their platform gets um, re revised because of them. So a socialist party, oh by the way, they bring new issues of policy agenda that the two major parties are not talking about. The socialist party brought us the minimum wage and child labor laws And finally, one of the other um, effects that third parties have in the United States is they bring voters into the voting booth that wouldn't have otherwise voted. There are some people that voted in the 2016 election and they only showed up just to vote for the Green Party or for, for the Libertarian Party. Otherwise, they hate Trump, they hate Hillary, they would have never shown up. So they allow people to have a voice, they give people a choice. So they bring new voters to the electorate. They allow voters who are dissatisfied with the Democrats, dissatisfied with the Republicans, to still participate. If you don't think the conservatives are conservative enough, the liberals are liberals enough, then you can vote for a third party candidate. They're not going to win, but at least you got to exercise your right to vote. All right, the question that you need to understand for your FRQs and the question you need to understand for your homework tonight is why do we need, why do we have a third uh, two-party system and not a multi-party system? How come other countries have multi-party systems? How come third and minor parties in other countries are allowed to be in government? They get elected and they get a portion of the government to them. And how come in the United States? That's not the case. We only have the Republicans and Democrats controlling government all the time, winning all of our elections. Two reasons. You need to know these, and I need you to understand them, not just copy down notes, but make sure you're understanding them. Our election system in, in the United States are, is rigged. It's rigged against third parties. It discourages third parties from ever gaining power, from ever gaining a foothold in government, and it, dis it encourages a two-party system. It's rigged against third parties, unlike in most countries where third parties can actually win and participate in the United States, they're left out of the political process. And here's why. These two systems are the reasons why. Number one, most of our elections are winner takes all, which means whoever gets the most votes gets the office. Here's the problem with that. If you're a third party, you do get some support. You do get some votes. Last year, the Green Party got millions of votes. However, since it's winner takes all, what does the loser get? The loser gets nothing. If you're a third party and you got some votes, good for you. But if you don't get the most votes, what do you get? You get nothing. You, don't, you get nothing in the Senate. You get nothing in the House of Representatives. You get nothing in the state elections. You get nothing in the local elections. Because it's hard for you to beat the major parties. It's hard for you to get the most votes and beat the Republican candidate and the Democratic candidate. Because of the winner-takes-all system, they get nothing. Even if they get some support, even if they do get some votes, they get nothing because it's winner takes all. So in the United States, 
we have a winner takes all system. Most all, oh, sorry, American elections are designed to discourage third parties. The winner takes all system says whoever gets the most votes wins, the loser gets nothing. Though third parties get some support, it's hard for them to get the most votes leaving them with nothing. Third party candidates know that they don't get as much support as the Republicans or the Democrats in every single election. And if they don't attain the most votes because of the way our system is set up, because of the winner takes all system, they get nothing. If they don't win, they get nothing. They don't get a foothold in our government. You can put here, no foothold, no control. Even a little bit, a tiny piece of the pie, they don't get. No power for third parties that don't get the most votes. All right, the next one is a little bit harder to understand. I need you to follow along. Every 10 years, what happens in the United States? We do a census. We count the number of people living in each state. Why? What's the main reason? Because in the House of Representatives, we have to do what? What's the word? Reapportionment. We have to do reapportionment, which means we have to allocate the number of seats in the House of Representatives depending on each state's population. So every 10 years, we do reapportionment based on the result of the census. After we do that, let's say we gave New York 27 seats in the House. It is the responsibility of the state legislature, of the state, of the government of New York, to divide its state into that many districts. So how many districts is New York divided by? It has 27 seats, so how many districts does New York have? It has 27 congressional districts. How many does Texas have? Texas, Texas has 36 seats, so it's going to have to divide itself into 36 equally populated districts. I have a picture over here. This is Texas's 36 congressional districts. Each one approximately has equal population um, to each other. You belong over here. This is District 15 of Texas. Each one of these districts is responsible for electing every two years one representative to the House of Representatives. A total of how many representatives in Texas? 36. 36. But each one of these districts are is responsible for electing one, one single member, and filling one single seat in the House of Representatives. Does everybody understand that? All right. What's the problem with that when it comes to third parties? The problem is, when it comes to congressional elections in the House of Representatives, all the parties are fighting for how many seats? Per district? They're fighting for, they're fighting for one. They're fighting for one seat in the House of Representatives. You got the Democrats, you got the Republicans, and you got the many third parties that we have fighting for a single seat per district. And who's probably going to win those seats? The major party candidate. It's probably going to be the Republican candidate. It's probably going to be the Democratic candidate. And who's probably not going to win those seats? Third the third party. Even though third parties have some support in the district, it's hard for them to beat the Republican candidate or to beat the Democratic candidate. And they end up with nothing because they're all fighting for one singular seat in the House of Representatives. By the way, anybody know who your representative is in the House of Representatives for District 15? He's a Democrat named Vicente Gonzalez is your representative. All right, so to go over this again, each state is divided into districts. 
This is called redistricting. After every census, we divide each state into, into the, to the seats that they were allocated during reapportionment. Who has the easiest time redistricting? You look at these states right here, how many districts do they have? They have one. They don't have to divide their city into states at all. They get one representative in the house. Each district elects one single member to the house. Okay, that's redundant. Not single, like, relationship status. But we want a singular member to the House of Representatives. Let's put HOR. And as a result, third parties get a disadvantage because it's hard for third parties to beat the Republican or Democratic candidates for that single seat. They're all fighting for one seat, and it's hard for the Republican candidate, I mean, for the third party candidates to win more votes than either the Republican candidate or the Democratic candidate. Sometimes they would beat one of these guys. That happens a lot. They would beat the Democratic candidate, but they're not going to beat both of them. They, have, they just have too much support. And this is why I told you our elections are rigged against third parties in the United States from ever gain, gaining a foothold in our government. So how does it work in other countries, you might be asking. How come other countries are allowed to have rainbows and we get this? So let's talk about that. In other countries, they don't use the winner-takes-all system or the single-member district system. They've evolved past that to make their elections more representative. They have a, something called a proportional representation system. Proportional representation system. All right, how does this work? In other countries, especially the countries in Europe, you don't vote for candidates for Congress. Like, you don't vote for Ted Cruz. You don't vote for Bernie Sanders. What you do is you vote for their parties. So during election time, you don't choose names. You choose parties. So for example, let's say this class is a country. Or Tashika is sitting right now. That's the blue party. Melanie's is the teal party. That's the red party, and over there is the orange party. During election time, people get to choose between parties. They don't get to choose between candidates. You know uh, which candidates are running for which party, but you don't choose the candidates. You don't choose individuals. You, use par you choose parties. And depending on the election results, they're going to divide up their Congress in that way. So for example, if the blue party does really well, and get 60% of the votes, of the total votes in that particular country, what is their Congress going to look like? If there's 100 members in their Congress, how many of those members will be from, blue, from the Blue Party? 60. It would be 60 people from the Blue Party. If the Teal Party do worse and they get 20%, how many from the Teal Party do we get in this particular Congress? 20. We get 20 members from the Teal Party. But the beauty is, even if you don't get the most votes, you still get represented in Congress. Because let's say Orange Party sucks and nobody likes them. They get 3% of the votes. How many people from in Congress would, would there be from the Orange Party? Three. There's, they still have a foothold. They still have members in Congress that are from the Orange Party. They still have a little bit of power. Unlike in the United States, it's winner-takes-all system. Only the Republicans and Democrats get to be part of the Congress. But in other countries, that's not the case. Third parties can win, third parties can get a foothold. So proportional representation. Seats are awarded to parties depending on the percentage of votes they get.
Alright. On the board, what you see is what the 2012 House of Representatives would have looked like if we use a proportional system instead of the systems that we have now. We have some people, from, we would have some people from the Tea Party, the Constitution Party, we'll have the Republicans and Democrats, of course, but the little parties will have members, they'll have seats in, in the House of Representatives if, that, if, that, if that's what the system that we use in the United States. Unfortunately for third parties, that is not the case. All right. Another major thing in this particular lesson, American political parties are weak. Remember that. Compared to other parties around the world, our parties are weak. What do I mean by weak? I mean they don't have a lot of control over their members. They don't have a lot of say in the decisions that their members get to make once they're in office. Right now, if I was a Republican in the Senate, I'm not really looking back at what my, my, the Republican Party wants me to do. I can make my own decisions. I'm not forced to obey my party. Sometimes I obey my party, or most of the time I obey my party, but that's because I want to obey my party. In other countries, people in office are like soldiers for their party. They do exactly what their party wants them to do. They make decisions according to what their party wants them to do. In the United States, political parties don't have a lot of control. They don't have that much control over their, their individual members in, in government. So right now, the Republican Party can't really boss Donald Trump around. He can do his own thing. He can make decisions that would be against the party, that would be against the party platform if he wants to. And that is because in the United States, our parties are weak. They don't have as much control as they do back in Europe. They don't have as much control as they do as in parties in, in, in Asia, for example. So why is that? We talked about one already. What weak, what, what the one thing that weakens political parties in the United States is the media. The media allows candidates to um, address the voters directly without relying too much on their what? Political. On their political party. The media gives candidates for office a little bit more freedom, a little bit more independence from their political party because they don't have to rely on them as much Secondly, they allow candidates to be more independent. From their parties. Republicans and Democrats know they don't have to be completely reliant on their political party. They don't have to completely obey their political 